Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as the attendee in listen-only mode. Question or you need me to repeat something, please by all means use that texting box at the corner of your screen. I will also a couple times during the session be posing a couple of questions that you can respond to. And obviously this isn't quite as interactive as if we were face to face, but we'll do the best we can to make this an interactive experience. So I do have to say go orange. We had a big win against Clemson last night. So after a rough start to basketball season, we're happy that we're getting things back on track. So um, I think it's really important that any session, any presentation, any paper, any research project where we are talking about individuals that communicate using alternative means, their voices ought to be first and foremost. And so throughout this presentation and including right here at the beginning, I want to start with the words of people who utilize this method of communication. So I'm going to start with two folks, um, Jamie Burke, who is actually a graduate of Syracuse University. And he is someone who types to communicate. He still types to communicate. He now types independently and reads a lot what he types. Jamie wrote this when he was in high school. He said, it felt like freedom from autism. Have you ever been trapped and the door was opened and you ran outside and shouted, yay? That's how it felt for me. Uh, that's Jamie there with his mother, Sherry, and Doug Becklin, the former director of this institute and the former dean of the School of Education. I think it's important to recognize that in the United States, facilitated communication, typing to communicate, RPM, all of, um, all of that kind of goes into that has been really associated most closely with autism. And so a lot of the examples and things you hear and see in the US come through a lens of autism. And while certainly I'm gonna to touch on some elements related to autism, and Jamie is someone who identifies as autistic, there is also a large community of folks um, with Down syndrome that utilize this method, both locally and internationally. And our second um, folk person that I'm going to be sort of introducing this morning um, her name is Mary. She is from Italy, and I just actually returned from Reggio Emilia, where I attended an international FC conference. And several of the panelists there were folks with Down syndrome that used this method to communicate and um, attend college. And so wherever I include text from someone in Italy, I will include the original text in Italian. The translation was done by a colleague of mine in, in um, Italy. So this is Mary. Being behind so many episodes of discrimination lies the rooted idea that being able to speak is equivalent to being able to think. Under the banner of a fairer world, everyone should be given the fundamental right to communicate. And this right also applies to those who need different tools to do so. That idea of communication as a fundamental human right is deeply, deeply undergirds the work that we do here. We view communication as essential to people's ability to, to exist and be part of the world and respect for people's communication, however that manifests itself, is a fundamental right and in line with the, the disability rights um, a mantra, nothing about us without us. So this is central to how we position our work. So the big ideas for today, um, you got a chance to hear who I am. I wish I got a chance to hear all of you, but I, I can see the list of folks that are here and it represents um, some folks I know and lots of folks I don't. And so I'm really welcome to all of you and with the backgrounds you bring. I wanna start by talking a little bit about presuming and constructing confidence. And then the majority of our time today is going to be focused on what is typing to communicate? It's connection to movement, it's connection to AAC, key elements of support, who might be a candidate, and then how do you um, get more information if you'd like to know more about this. Obviously, when people contact me with interest in typing to communicate, um, they often want to jump right into talking about the what is it and how do you do it? And I always ask people to step back and say, before you talk about method, before you talk about devices or supports or anything, we have to start with a fundamental idea that for any of the rest of that to make any difference, we have to start from what we talk about as a presumption of competence or the idea that all people are capable of learning, that all people are interested in communication, and that all people are capable of far more than they're currently able to demonstrate giving the tools and resources at their disposal. 
that's true whether someone is a person with Down syndrome, a person with autism, or somebody who doesn't identify as disabled. All of us are undoubtedly capable of more if we have different tools at our disposal. So starting from a presumption of competence, um, I want to share something that Jamie wrote on this topic. Folks, the ideal of the presumption of competence means the desire is to see people as intelligent and capable of capturing your listening attention. And a feeling of confidence in the attempts to engage the enormous importance of all the work it has taken to move people like me to places like here. Do not assume your understanding of what is present before you to be the final answer. Question what you currently believe about someone with a disability. Remember, we can all make dangerous assumptions. I believe this optimistic view is beginning to take hold in education. But for people who are adults, we need to put more strong work in learning how to make successes over long time silences. Perhaps then it is paramount that we remember the beauty of the potent old golden rule. Presuming competence initiates a fundamental idea that competence is a beginning point to realize the emotion of great self-worth. Jamie's obviously a beautiful writer. Um, part, what I think is most important about this is what I have highlighted in red. As educators, as parents, as as speech language therapists, as psychologists, whatever our perspective is that we bring to this work, I think we have to start from the assumption that what is happening now isn't the end. That we all learn more, do more, and everyone has the potential for growth. And so we have to start from the assumption that whatever someone is currently doing, we need to assume that there's more that could come and more that can be done. And that both goes for us as researchers and scholars and practitioners that we're gonna continue to learn more just like it goes for the folks that we support who are communicating through typing. Um, when I came into this field, I didn't know anything about this. And I learned by getting to know people who type to communicate. Sujit Karup is someone, um, another uh, folk person here from Syracuse. He graduated from a local high school. He's currently a college student um, that types to communicate. And I like his sort of introduction to this work. Systematic and focused in the work and my learning, showing my intelligence and depth of many subjects to all folks who did not believe in my smartness. I find much serenity and lots of peace on my day-to-day -day activities. Can't do so without facilitated communication. The enhancement of a very cloistered life to openness and more solid, durable communication. Lots of folks we know talk about that idea of opportunities becoming open, becoming available, once they had a way to show others that they were thinking um, people with ideas of their own. So this idea of presumption of competence is that it's really important that we never assume that difficulties with communication somehow imply lack of intellectual competence or interest in participation. So much of what we used to think about developmental disability, whether that's Down syndrome, Rett syndrome, autism was, was ill-informed. And there was this prevailing assumption that individuals that did not speak, therefore, were not thinking sentient people. Well, obviously, lots of research has shown that that's not the case. We saw that with cerebral palsy. We've seen it in lots of other ways that as people develop means of communication and make themselves understood, then we understand more about sort of their perspective and their, and their view of the world. But the, so the presumption, presumption of confidence goes hand in hand with this idea that we have to make what's known as the least dangerous assumption. That in the absence of absolute evidence to the contrary, we have to make the assumption that a proven fault would be least dangerous. And so that means providing as many opportunities for ways to learn, ways to access literacy, ways to engage with text, ways to be included in school and community. We're going to watch just a very brief, um, less than five minute section of a video. And I was hesitant to do this because I know it's hard when I'm not there engaging with you, but I think it's really important to have a sense of, of at least what we're talking about and have a sort of common language. Um, this is a very short piece from a short documentary that was actually made in 2004, 2004, 2005, um, called My Classic Life as an Artist, a portrait of Larry Bissonnette. 
You may know Larry because he's gone on to, you could say, fame in the film Wretches and Jabbers, which was released a few years ago. But we're going to watch just a couple of minutes from the beginning of this film, where Larry describes his communication. He describes some of the things that are hard for him and the kinds of supports that are helpful. So we're going to watch a short clip. I'm then going to come back to just two questions at the end. So if you want to focus on two, I'm going to ask you at the end to type some of what Larry says about the challenges he experiences and what supports were most helpful, either that he described or that you saw. Um, Larry's going to be talking about the connection of movement and autism and typing, and we can make connections to lots of other things as well. So just one second while I flip over to my DVD player. skilled reading texts will marry. Sonic sensitivity, placidity in personal relationships, loose personal hygiene, language processing problems, primitive plastic social skills, cooking behaviors, activities limited by obsessive routines, gastronomical choices stuck on McDonald's, rope learning habits, this is a summary of autism's daily impact on my life. The proudest opportunity I ever had to tell others that I was intelligent was with outsider communication technique, facilitated communication. Motoring this new vehicle began in pristine with outside natural scenery Vermont almost 10 years ago. Facilitated communication lands basis for neurological collection of spatial awareness. Label of doing language meaningfully is lost in soup of disabled map of autism, so I need a potholder of touch to grab it. <coughs> Echolalic language comes down my pipes like a pre-programmed train that is way off its itinerary. If there is some pressing problem in my life, like supper being two minutes late, my speech works really well. <coughs> Stereotypical phrases poorly articulated in a loud, phenomenally loud, grating on nerves voice, isn't deliberate communication, but only pattern behavior. I rely on typing for my personally important ideas. I probably wouldn't order pizza by typing my words, but I would tell you my opinion about the poor working stiff who makes it. <laughs> My apologies, for some reason the video is only coming through with sound, it looks like. Let me try one thing here. Try opening it back up. Never so easy to paper walls with ambitious words, but the real difference in clearing my needs has been the wonderful, caring, less worried about Larry's peculiarity. I have my apologies. I have no idea why that is not coming through. It comes through on my screen, but not on yours. Can you pull it up a different way in one second? Okay, this will not be quite, this will not unfortunately not have um, subtitles, but you'll be able to see it.
It's significant that my artistic style lets me express personal perspectives of autistic or intelligent or mantra. <laughs> opportunity I ever had to tell others that I was intelligent was with outsider communication technique, facilitated communication. Facilitated communication lands basis for neurological collection of spatial awareness. Label of doing language meaningfully is lost in super disabled map of autism, so I need a potholder of touch to grab it. some pressing problem in my life, like supper being two minutes late, my speech works really well. Stereotypical phrases, poorly articulated in a loud, phenomenally loud, grating on nerves voice, isn't deliberate communication, but only pattern behavior. I rely on typing for my personally important ideas. I probably wouldn't order pizza by typing my words, but I would tell you my opinion about the poor working stick who makes it. It's ever so easy to paper. Okay, so apologies for that. Not sure why the other video wasn't working. Um, if we come back now to to sort of the two questions I asked you to think about. That's just a tiny little clip, and obviously you're you're missing a lot of the rest of what's part of, of Larry's life and and what his experience was as somebody who um, spent the early part of his life in an institution and then eventually lived in the community with his family, learned to type and communicate, and now travels the world. He types independently now, and he reads. But I want to come back to the question I asked, and feel free to just type ideas. What were some of the challenges that you noted that Larry described or that you saw Larry experiencing related to communication? Let's think about that question first. So you can go ahead and use the chat box. It's open so everyone can see what you have to say. But what were some of the things you heard Larry say or that you noted related to his communication? Okay, I'm not sure if anyone's typing anything. Nothing's popping up for me. Yep, um, I see uh, um, physical movement. 
scripted speech driving his communication not indicative of his true communication. And anxiety about changes. Observed behaviors. And then uh, Larry indicated that what we normally think of as his communication a lot of phrases, for example, were not actually what he really wanted to communicate. Absolutely. So difficulties with movement. He also talks about um, having difficulties with echolalia and this disconnect between his verbal speech and the things that he typed. So I want to pose the second question. If you could just think about what you either saw or you observed or heard him supports that were helpful to him and being able to communicate or what might he need for that to happen. Sorry, I don't know if there's a setting you need to change so I can see what people are typing. <laughs> Research is coming out of the fields of neuroscience, um, drawing on work of folks that do that are occupational therapists that do work on sensory integration. Um, there's a whole lot of fields coming together, but there's a growing awareness that there is a large movement component to why people experience difficulties with speech. So I'm going to ask you to follow a set of very simple directions. So for this, you might want to you know, move your keyboard out of the way slightly and have some sort of piece of paper in front of you. If you don't have a piece of paper, you can always pretend to do it with your finger, but it'd be more helpful if you had a piece of paper and a pen. So do it if you can. If not, we'll talk about it in a second. So I would like you to start by making a circle on the floor with your non-dominant foot. So I'm a right-handed person, and therefore I'm a right dominant foot person. So my non-dominant foot would be my left. So make a circle on the floor and keep that circle going while you write your name. You can write your name with your dominant hand is fine, but keep the circle going while you do it. Now, while that circle is still going, I want you to put um, the pen in the other hand and try to write your name. So now you have non-dominant hand and non-dominant foot. So keep that circle going. And now finally, you can put the pen back in whichever hand you want. I'd like you to write the following sentence. So I'm going to dictate a sentence to you. Don't write what's on the screen. Write what I dictate. I want, you to dict I want you to write down the sentence, Syracuse University beat Clemson last night. Great. Okay. So I want to ask, what did you notice? What happened when you engaged with that activity? Did anyone notice anything strange? So you can go ahead and type your response. took longer. One movement affected the other negatively, took longer to write than I'm used to. Could do one thing at a time. It was hard to pay attention. Okay, hard to keep my left foot going. Um, people often say it's very difficult to do this correctly. Often people, their handwriting gets difficult. Um, some people report that their foot changes direction. When they start writing, their foot actually starts going in the opposite direction or becomes a line. Some people can't remember the sentence and need to have it repeated. So there's lots and lots of things that tend to happen to people when they do this activity. This is not a simulation of disability. It's not. All this is is a simulation of having some sort of movement challenge. It's difficult for folks, obviously. One of the reasons that this tends to be difficult is because you're relying on multiple parts of your brain at once. You're doing a motor task and a cognitive task and a memory task. And, it's try and you're crossing midline and all of these pieces that come together. And so for some folks, this idea of a task that independently would have been quite simple to do, when done together, become very, very complicated, is a little bit of an illustration of having a movement challenge. And the idea of dealing with multiple forms of information coming in at once and having to process that. And having to perform a task when your body and is different than perhaps what your mind is trying to tell it to do. 
Movement is a vital essential to everything we do in life. But not just movement, we need to move volitionally, with intention, have an idea and carry it out. And at the same time, we have to inhibit movements that aren't necessary or desired. And for most of us, that happens really naturally. And we have this really deep well of movement patterns that we get to draw on. So when we go to do something, we don't have to think through all the steps. But for some folks with developmental disabilities, that motor planning sequencing doesn't happen in quite the same fluid way. And so taking an idea and enacting it is complicated. And the, the movement necessary for speech is way more complicated and coordinated and requiring lots of different functions than the rhythmic staccato movement necessary to type, which is why most folks start by typing with one finger when they Lots of people with various developmental disabilities experience motor planning differences, sometimes known as dyspraxia, which is a difficulty with voluntary action. And it's essential to remember that this is about performance and not ability, but it's about taking an idea and then enacting it in your body. This is especially challenging for some people when tasks are new, when there's multiple sequences of steps, when you have to focus on more than one task at a time, like I just asked you to do, or when they're done in new environments. So obviously, if you think about the circumstances under which people need to communicate, particularly in school or under stressful situations, motor planning often becomes more difficult the more the stakes are high, the more things are unfamiliar. And so part of what we're trying to help people do is learn to use their bodies in new and different ways so that they can mitigate some of these difficulties with voluntary action. Obviously, we're just touching on motor planning and motor differences, and we could do an entire day-long presentation on this, but I want to touch on the motor component to it. Um, so I asked both, both Jamie, and then I also I have text from Mary from Italy to kind of highlight what this means for them. For Jamie, he says motor planning ability doesn't exist. He cannot plan movement. It doesn't mean he doesn't want to initiate movement. So I'm just going to highlight a few pieces of this. Can you attempt to comprehend the anger that he feels because of this. He is here statements regarding bad behavior and I try to elevate my soul to stay calm when others assumed I was unable to understand what they were saying thinking I wasn't intelligent. Can you imagine how crazily hard it is for us when our systems are so incredibly mismatched with what is expected and then with what happens? And this is the piece of it that I think is really important. Jamie talks about the fact that for him, every experience has to keep getting sorted out and interpreted every single time. So instead of having that deep reservoir of movement patterns that you can draw on and ways to interpret sensory information, Jamie and many other folks that I've met describe having to continually do this, which can lead to difficulty with emotion and anxiety as well as with communication. So he talks about being dysregulated and having extreme sensory overload leading to what he calls his man overboard feeling. And so trying to sit in an in a infusing classroom and take in information when there's all these things going on really impacts his rhythm and his midline. And so Jamie really credits a lot of the therapies that he's had in addition to typing to help him be able to do that. Um, Mary mentioned, in connection to Down syndrome, the connection between sensory movement and communication. And she talks about, you know, we often spoke on the basis of cliche, knowing little of what lives those, of what lives for those who are in this condition. Sorry, some of the translation's hard. She has incredibly complex language, and so when you translate it from Italian to English, it's sometimes a little funny. Trisomy 21 determines a series of problems at the muscular level, hypertone that reduces activity of the limbs and makes movement slow and clumsy, language difficulties and extreme sensory sensitivity. Falling into the misunderstanding of the binomial Down syndrome and mental retardation is misleading and depends on a common problem of language disorders that prevent communication, making people believe it's a cognitive deficiency. From an early age, I realized that my mind was efficient, but I had a functioning problem. I felt suffocated by the mass of emotions and sensory stimuli. It happened that I felt overwhelmed by noise and anxiety to the point of not being able to move a muscle. 
In those moments, feeling my behavior was considered a pure win only made the situation worse. How to make it clear I had an emotional block? I was lucky because I found a way to communicate through writing to the PC what I had inside. I think it's really important to see these connections between autism and Down syndrome, and that both of these folks it describe these difficulties with sensory regulation and the challenge of then communicating um, with, when their bodies were feeling so bombarded by information. So when you look at communication as having a deeply metaphoric component and also a deep um, emotional component, you can understand why support might be necessary. That's the original text in Italian. It's quite beautiful. So how does the physical support um, of typing help? Well, for some people, it can help them to initiate a response. A lot of folks, particularly folks with low tone or folks who have difficulty initiating an activity, um, that backward resistance can help them initiate movement. For others, it's about slowing down impulsivity. I've worked with lots of folks who they can, but what they do is type a series of repetitive words and phrases. And then it becomes the facilitator's job to actually slow that down so that they can connect an idea with a movement. Helping people learn to organize their bodies and be able to, do, to, um, to work in situations that are new and be able to learn new movement patterns is a lot of what the facilitator and typer interaction is about. It's also about providing sensory feedback. Lots of folks with sensory and movement challenges report not knowing where their body is in space unless something is touching it. So the facilitator is providing proprioceptive feedback to the person so they know where their body is in space and can move more efficiently. And sometimes it's about stopping perseverative patterns and helping interrupt ineffectual movement. the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead. So what is it and how does it connect to um, other forms of AAC? So typing to communicate or facilitate communication is very simply a communication strategy method in which people with disabilities that involve communication impairments express themselves by pointing, right? It's always pointing at something. With young children, it might be pointing at pictures. Obviously, our goal is for people to be pointing at letters and devices so that they can be as independent as possible. We often refer to it as facilitated communication training to emphasize that it's a skill that you can learn and that it has to be taught just like any other skill with a goal of becoming physically independent as much as possible, typing with as minimal support as possible, and or speaking what you read aloud. So we really want folks to be as independent as possible, to type with as many people as possible, and to be less and less reliant on other people's support. That's the ultimate goal. It's important to think of it as a skill, just like you think about learning any other new skill. I always relate it to learning to play piano because I'm a piano player. So you have to practice and patterns that you can draw on so that later you're able to be more spontaneous and more creative. It involves having a communication partner who provides a variety of supports, which we'll talk about those in a second. And to, a, to slow and stabilize movement, inhibit impulsive pointing, or, in, or spur someone to initiate. The facilitator is never moving the course of person toward the device or leading them in any way. The, the, the physical support is always backward resistance away from a device and returning someone to a neutral position. Um, we see this work, and this is really important, as part of a total or comprehensive communication approach. I am never in favor of throwing out things someone is already doing, whether it's trying to develop speech, whether it's using a, sim a symbol system if that's working for them, <laughs> whether it's using simple words or phrases or facial expressions. People communicate. When there's more communication, there's more communication. So we don't see this as a replacement for other strategies already in place. Instead, it's yet another tool for somebody's toolbox. Obviously, it takes a significant amount of time and effort, and so you have to really invest in this in terms of your energy and your time, but we don't encourage, we want people to keep using other systems that support them. So obviously, AAC is a much broader field that encompasses lots of supports that either augment or provide alternative forms of communication for people who have minimal um, verbal communication. And but we sort of see this when people ask, you know, is, is, it a, is it a device? Is it a, a communication tool? 
we really see it as a tech strategy. People will ask me, so what's an FC device? Well, it doesn't really matter what you're pointing at, although we prefer people to point at devices that have voice output and have some memory. Um, most of the folks we work with use iPads. Um, and again, you might be pointing at different things as you're progressing, but it's really the technique by which you access that device. So the way in which you're pointing with support, and then it's a teaching strategy to help people learn more effective ways to communicate. So Quinn, in this quote, this is from a chapter Quinn wrote with my colleague Casey Woodfield and I, I really like the fact that she says, while typing opened the door to a world of speaking um, and a world of engaging with speaking people, she says she still uses basic sign language, she still communicates a few words, if that makes sense in the setting. So you don't throw out everything as you add new tools. There's lots of pieces that are come into play when some um, and this picture, and that's actually a, a clip from the film you can see there. There's Larry. There's lots of things going on, and I'm going to sort of talk about a few of them. There are three main areas, elements of support that facilitators provide to the communication users. And those are, there's relate to physical support, communicative support, and emotional support. And any one of those things in isolation isn't going to do it. We have to think, recognize that there are so many things at play for people who are non-speaking or minimally speak. All of them. So I'm going to touch briefly on each one, and then we'll talk a little bit about candidacy. So the physical support that the facilitator provide can look like initially helping someone learn how to isolate an index finger. For some people, that's a new skill. So that might be as simple as having somebody hold a marker so that they can point their finger but ways in helping people develop an effective point. Sometimes you might need to stabilize the arm if someone has significant tremor. It almost always refers to backward resistance to slow down the pace of pointing and to pull someone back to a neutral position. It often surprises folks when I do media inquiries or conversations with folks who aren't familiar with the method or perhaps a of are concerned about the method, they're often surprised to find out that the resistance is backward and that you're actually pulling someone away from a device. It could be just a touch to the forearm or shoulder to help somebody get started. I work with folks who just might need a touch to the shoulder but no other form of physical touch. It could be light tapping to support rhythm. In some cases it might be holding or releasing of a shirt. So it depends on where the person is and whether they are working on focus or rhythm or really just looking, working on that initial point. The communication support is much more about the message and making sure that that's clear and understandable to somebody else. Sometimes it's a skill reminder like slow down, make sure you're looking at the whole board, make sure you are, you know, you type three letters in a row that don't make sense together. Sometimes it's telling someone just, what's the next letter? Keep going. Look, when folks are first learning how to type, we encourage facilitators to repeat the letters that they type so that they can hear it. So they start building that back and forth. Eventually, you fade that support out, but it's the cues related to the message itself. This is especially important if someone types something that's unclear to you. That's your chance to go, you know what, I'm not sure what you're saying. Can you add, can you go back and explain that to me? Or this word is unclear, can you tell me what you meant? Can you add to that? So those clarifying statements are really important. So the, the third form of support that tends to come into play is the emotional support. There is a huge body of research related to anxiety and performance. And lots of folks with developmental disabilities experience a great deal of anxiety, and they also often have been treated as people who are less than competent. So part of the job of the facilitator is to convey that, ex that expectant attitude that you know that person is interested in engaging with you and that you are communicating your trust and your belief in them and their, their efforts. So all of us benefit when people interact with us in calm, respectful ways. And so sometimes it's telling people to stick with a message and finish a thought, and sometimes it's recognizing that there's other emotional things going on that need to be addressed in order for someone to effectively communicate. Part of the emotional support piece is also recognizing that these supports are going to look different depending on someone's 
emotional state and depending on where someone is in their relationship with their facilitator. There is a relationship component to this that can't be avoided, nor should it. <laughs> Relationships are essential to what we do. So when people ask me who would be a potential candidate for typing, I always have a pretty glib first answer is which is if they don't have a means of communicating effectively, we need to think about options. This might not be it. I mean, this is an easy work. And as you know, it's controversial. <laughs> so it isn't usually or ever people's first choice. They usually exhaust many other options before they try this or before they come to us and look for support. But when somebody comes to us and their child or their sister or folks we work with that do have quite a bit of verbal speech that they use differently than their typing. It's important to recognize, and this comes from Christy Casa, who's one of my colleagues in Colorado, that this method of communication crosses disability types. It isn't just about autism. It isn't just about Down syndrome. It isn't just about cerebral palsy. It's about not having useful speech and having movement differences or struggles with motor planning. That's what we really look at. And so when folks um, are not able to independently, for example, if someone can independently type or independently access a board using eye gaze or a head switch, they might not need facilitation. But we really want to look at what options are available for people and make sure that they have sort of a way to access communication. I'm actually going to pause for a moment and open it up to, to a couple of questions um, before I do the last piece, just because I want to make sure that we leave time for questions. So uh, somebody is asking, um, can we share the slides? Um, yes, I would be happy to share slides. I also, you know, and happy to chat, uh, chat with folks later if you're looking for more information. Um, you know, somebody posed a question about the controversy. Yes, this work has been been controversial in the sense that there are folks who believe that the people typing are not the people that are the author of those ideas. Obviously, there's, you know, there's concerns in all of our fields whenever anybody is relying on support to, to do anything. We want to make sure that it's that person. And so there's been research in both sides that have, have sort of um, looked at this question of authorship and validity. We don't have time to go into a lot of that right now, but I am happy to have conversations with folks about that offline or in a different venue. Um, you know, I often say when people ask me the question, there's no research that supports this because that question is often right, brought up. You know, we'll, we'll hear that from folks. My response is always really simple. The studies have been mixed. And there are a lot of studies using a variety of method methodologies that support the validity of typing to communicate, and I'm happy to share references. We have an extensive uh, list of references and an annotated bibliography available on our website. Um, I also ask to often talk with people about what constitutes research and what is the body of evidence that we need to amass for people. And one of the, the things that I think is really vitally important, and I'm actually just gonna, gonna show this because I think this is a really important, a lot of the, the, the conversation around typing to communicate has gotten stuck on, is this a valid access method for people with disabilities? As a global yes or no question. I think that's an entirely the wrong question. That may be an interesting research question to talk about, but we very rarely hold anything up to a universal yes or no. I think the more important question, particularly when we're talking about um, an individual person, is is typing to communicate useful and reliable for this person? And what is the evidence we have of that? I think we also have to recognize that this growing number of folks who once required significant support to communicate and now communicate independently is another form of evidence. But I always think instead of asking global questions, we should be asking specific questions about individual people. And we need to be asking different kinds of questions such as how, not if, but how can typing to communicate help people become more effective and independent in their communication? Um, I see another question. Will public schools provide facilitators? Absolutely, some, many do. Um, there are students all over the United States and internationally in public schools that are typing. 
Typically, the person who provides the direct facilitation support would be a one-on-one -on -one care professional, although often speech language therapists are trained or special ed teachers, but that's a very common thing um, is there for there to be a sort of a sign to support a student who types to communicate. And um, it's really important to have an like a whole team of people that are on board because like any form of communication, it is most effective when everyone is using that form of communication with that person, both at home and at school. Oh, I appreciate that feedback. It's, it is hard to hear, you know, people talk about the negative feedback. Yes, um, this, this work is not easy. <laughs> it is complicated, it is messy and it requires us to be t using best practices all the time and to be making sure we are doing our work with fidelity. And that in includes making sure that we're documenting our practice, that we are keeping, um, really taking careful data on what students are doing and how people's skill development is progressing. It also means looking at all the various other ways that we look at whether something is evidence-based for someone. So my is the question, what would it take to convince me it doesn't work? I would ask the opposite question. What would it take to convince people that for this individual it does? I recognize, I'm a researcher at heart. Um, you know, that's, I, in addition to, I do research on lots of things beyond, beyond typing to communicate. Um, my work has always been framed around inclusive education. And so because my work is always framed around inclusion, I start with the, pos the always starting with looking at what's gonna create the most possibility for someone and trying to figure out what tools would be at someone's disposal. So I think asking global questions again of does this work for everyone? Nothing works for everyone. But does this work for some individuals? Absolutely. And I really believe in trying to look with fidelity and careful implementation, are, are people able to communicate more effectively? And I'm happy to talk with anyone about specific research questions. Um, how do you get resistant schools? I think, like anything, we need to make sure that we're framing this around um, this as also being connected to academic access. That's how I got connected to this work. I was a teacher first. I was a teacher first working in a fully inclusive school, meaning no kids out of Gen Ed ever. And we, I worked with students with really challenging communication. And so when I pursued my doctorate, I pursued this work not because I was a speech language person or a behavior, um, somebody was coming at it from a psychological perspective, I came at this work as a teacher. And I really wanted to think about how do I ensure every student in my class can tell me what they know. And so when I look at, all right, when I'm working with school districts, first of all, I don't encourage families to go to school districts when they just first get started at typing. People need to develop some consistency and some reliability before you go and bring a new communication system into a school system. But I will work with school systems to talk about, okay, how are we gonna figure out what this child is, knows and is able to do? And how can I help you think about, about pointing as one way to do that? So we often frame it about academic access in addition to communication and really look at the tools and strategies that would be necessary. Yes, there's been a lot of concern this summer. Um, ASHA put out a, a new statement and with real concerns about um, potential sanctions for speech language therapists who, who facilitate. It's really individual school systems and are interpreting that differently. And individual school systems are, are, are really looking to their specialists to take their expert knowledge and to make their best clinically informed decisions, which is always what we encourage. And so I know, for example, I'm working with lots of schools in the area, and they're certainly aware of the ASHA statement, but they also feel very strongly that this is a human, a, a human right and a civil right for students, and they want to make sure that things are being done with fidelity and careful implementation, but they still are interested in pursuing typing. Are there public funds available for typing? Um, it really depends. Lots of folks that, I mean, we run a free clinic here, which I actually should pop ahead to some of the things that we do. So, um, but in terms of, in schools, yes. Uh, students who are getting served under IDEA um, that have IEPs, schools can provide a paraprofessional just like they would for anything else. 
um, for adults that are looking to access typing services. In, in, a lot of student folks use self-directed funds to be able to hire staff. Um, I just want to skip ahead. I'm going to try to come back to some more of these questions, but I just want to talk about what we do here in our last minute, a couple of minutes. So the ICI is housed at Syracuse University, um, but we are a research and training center. And so I, you know, I have a dual role. I'm a faculty member of the School of Education, and then I'm also the director of the institute. And we're a, you know, just a. We have three main purposes. We do research, um, public education, and then trainings. Um, we our research projects are varied and range from looking at the use of iPads to academic access for typing. We're doing lexical analysis research to quantitatively look at the types text produced by facilitators and typists. Um, we also obviously run a website and we make videos regularly. A lot of what we do though is also training. We do introductory trainings for folks who want to get started. We do those um, twice a year and then on an ad needed basis for, for other organizations. We hold monthly workshops for local typers, monthly practice events for facilitators. We have a practice room that is available for anyone who wants to come in and work with one of our trainers. Um, so there's lots of opportunities, summer conferences, workshops, lots of opportunities for people to get involved. If you want to know more or are potentially interested in exploring typing to communicate for somebody in your life, obviously this doesn't, this just scratches the surface of what's out there, um, but I would really encourage you to contact the resources under the column, say ICI or all us. And then the, on the other side are two other organizations that have significant um, experience and researches, research and resources around typing. That's the Wellspring Guild and United for Communication Choice. For us, our website is ici.syr.edu. That is the staff email for the whole institute. It goes to our secretary who will send your question out to the person it's most appropriate to. And that is also the, the secretary's phone number. Um, if anyone wants to say, it, I'm happy to talk with people, you know, I, I obviously have my own email address, you're welcome to contact me at that. But that assures that it goes out to our staff and makes sure that it goes to the right person. Um, all right, we have just a couple minutes left, so let me just see if, if I can answer any questions. Oh, somebody's talked about the importance. Yes, RPM. I haven't talked too much about RPM here. Rapid prompting method is really closely affiliated with, type, with, with facilitated yeah. communication. They have slightly different ways of getting through the sort of training process, but the go end goal is the same, which is pointing at text to be able to independently type and independently point. And so there's a lot of close affiliation between rapid prompting method and facilitated communication. And in fact, lots of folks utilize both methods or go back and forth between them. Um, Yes, typing can be included in IEPs, and if you want specific information on how to do that, I would encourage you to email me because we've actually done a lot of research on that. Um, often it will be embedded in several places. It can be embedded in through the personnel, through having a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional. It can be included as a, um, as a accommodation or modification. I also often will build in communication training into people's IEPs under supports for school, student on supports to the school on behalf of the student. So there's lots of ways that you can, can, can support that. But obviously you have to have a training involved. So I think we're just about out of time. Dr. Ashby, we thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and busy schedule to meet with us all here. Um, we thank all of you for coming and we will um, continue to be available as a resource at the National Down Syndrome Society if you have questions and um, with the ICI. And we, again, thank you all so much for coming. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. I look forward, if you have any questions, feel free to follow up. Have a wonderful day.